Yeah, well, thank you, William. Um, I'm Paul Farrelly, uh, I'm the host today, and uh, I wanted to welcome you all. I'm Mr. Nguida from UNESCO. Um, this is a this is a 900-year-old building with a 900-year-old queuing system. So on, on busy days like today with the, the trade union uh, lobby here, uh, people take an age to get in. So I hope uh, people will filter in um, for the program that you, you've put together. Um, I, I'm the MP for Newcastle on the Line, which is a, uh, a, a town in, 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 in the Midlands. And, uh, and I'm also, I've also been on the Country Movement Support Select Committee for 10 years, where we've been looking very closely at improving press standards, not the standards of people uh, as to how they treat the press. And I see Evan Harris, who used to be a former, uh, used to be an MP, who's um, the director of Hacked Off here, has, has just joined us. Um, I, I used to be a journalist myself before getting elected in 2001 for Reuters, The Independent on Sunday, and then, then The Observer. Um, I was a financial and very much an investigative uh, reporter. Um, with stories from write-throughs about the Russian mafia and the involvement of the politicians in money laundering, from how Nawaz Sharif repeated what Benazir Bhutto did in Pakistan, fleecing the country, uh, widespread corruption, that, that led to a diversionary border war with India and then ultimately to the, to the, um, to the, the, the army coup in Pakistan. Um, but I did all that uh, from the, not just the relative, the absolute safety of London here, where no matter what, uh, no matter how challenging or inquiring, uh, people simply don't kill journalists uh, or crusading members of parliament uh, for that matter. So um, every time I see a story about, about uh, people who, who uh, of my trade being treated appallingly, being killed uh, abroad, it, it, uh, it's, it, it just raises, raises the goose pimples on, on, on my skin. In October, 2006, it was nine years ago now, I remember getting involved in the campaign um, after the assassination of Anna Politkovskaya uh, in Moscow to try and get to, get to the truth. Um, I didn't know Marie Colvin, who was a reporter at the Sunday Times, killed in Syria doing a job, but I know many people uh, who worked with her, such as the great Christina Lamb from the Sunday Times, who, who did the same and run the same risks. Um, Peter, the recent uh, jailings in Egypt, of course, uh, only served to, to bring that country's uh, legal and government system into international disrepute, so, frankly. And you can only recoil in horror um, every time you see the next case of what is that, the systematic elimination in Mexico of journalists who expose and stand up to the drugs trade and their agents of the state who pursue them. Um, so, all power uh, to the elbow in shining a light uh, across the world uh, with the involvement of UNESCO on these attitudes, practices uh, that uh, stand in the way of journalists just doing their job um, and reporting and shedding the light themselves on, on, on things around the world. Um, a free press, we always say, is, is crucial to uh, a free society and in those countries fortunate to have one a well-functioning democracy. So I, I hope you enjoy your visit to Westminster today. I hope more people will join us. Uh, I wish you every success, success with the event and continuing the fight for press freedom uh, and safety for journalists doing the job that they felt, feel very often they're called to do. Paul, thank you very much. Two quick things uh, from me before I hand over to Sally. One is, this, this event has been organised uh, jointly, the Centre for Freedom of the Media, Article 19 and Penn International. Unfortunately, some people couldn't be here. The, the killed journalists, more than 700 couldn't be here. And in their honor, we have an empty chair uh, to symbolize their absence and those who couldn't come because of the force of the state and, and other uh, uh, violence. Second thing is, in introducing Geta uh, Chu Enghida, I should just say that you may or may not know that the UN Plan of Action on the Safety of Journalists and the Issue of Impunity was in a sense born in London. A group uh, working within the uh, UK National Commission for UNESCO uh, was exercised by the trend, the very bad trend, uh, towards the about 2009-10. Uh, in 2011, with the support of the National Commission, we put up the idea for a, an action-oriented inter-agency meeting of 
uh, headed by UNESCO. And we were very pleasantly surprised, despite many diplomatic battles and resistance, that within the next year, 2012, this became the UN Action Plan. And the key thing about the UNESCO and UN Action Plan is that it calls on all stakeholders, all parties, not just the governments, who are, of course, responsible, but also the civil society, the parliaments, and so on, to make it, uh, make it possible. So with that, I'll uh, hand over to uh, you, uh, Mr. Indita. Thank you so much for coming from Paris. Thank you. <clears throat> Honorable uh, members of parliament, uh, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to this event organized by uh, UNESCO, the Center for the Freedom of the Media, and International, and Article 19. We meet to commemorate the International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists and to launch the world trends in freedom of expression and media development special digital focus 2015. And I hope you've got a, a copy of it. I find it extremely interesting reading and uh, useful, full of useful information. Let me first of all express special thanks to the Right Honorable Paul Family for sponsoring the conference in this <coughs> prestigious venue, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association Room in the Palace of Westminster. And I am also pleasantly surprised that you were a journalist with Reuters, where I have spent 10 years of my life. Uh, so it's an interesting coincidence. One journalist is killed every five days, ladies and gentlemen. And this has been the appalling trend for the last 10 years. In total, more than 700 journalists all over the world have been killed in line of duty since 2006, according to UNESCO's Director General's report on the safety of journalists and the issue of impunity. These are people who dedicated their lives to freedom of expression and freedom of the press. 700 extremely courageous people who believe that people have the right to be informed in order to make proper decisions for their lives. We all know that this right is paramount and essential for the society to function freely. These journalists come in all shapes, unknown or famous, from poor or rich countries, running a blog providing public interest information, or working for a local community radio or an international media network. These are all heroes of information, heroes of freedom. This day, the 2nd of November, International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists is dedicated to them all. Today is a day to remember them and to call for justice. This situation is made worse because impunity has become a terrible crime. Less than 7% of cases of journalists killed have led to a conviction, which is less than 1 in 10. We're talking about just 55 cases out of more than 680 from 2006 to the start of this year. This is the ratio of unresolved cases according to information received by UNESCO from member states where journalists have been killed. As you may know, every two years, UNESCO issues a report to the Intergovernmental Council of the International Program for the Development of Communication otherwise known as IPDC, on the safety of journalists and the danger of impunity. This report is unique, a unique mechanism within the UN system to monitor and track the killings of journalists. The situation is most dramatic in conflict situations, where violent extremes have been carried out, acts of abhorrent violence against journalists, to crush freedom of thought and expression. The beheadings of journalists by ISIS Daesh embodies a steep challenge we face today. At the same time, most journalists are killed in less than prominent ways, but with equivalent poisonous impact on their colleagues and societies as a whole. This year alone, at least 70 journalists have been killed in the line of duty. We cannot allow the situation to go on. This must be our message today. First, we must stand up to violent extremists, to their hate propaganda, with, which disseminates messages of violence against journalists and freedom of expression. 
Even in the most difficult conflict situations, we cannot allow impunity to stand. We must insist on justice being done. And this means developing all new counter-narratives of shared values and human rights, engaging young people especially. This spirit guides UNESCO's new framework for action to support young people in resisting radicalization online, to promote the internet as a force for peace. Second, we must do more to ensure that governments can and do take justice forward, strengthening legislation, crafting regulations, and building capacity. Half of all journalists' killings have happened in peacetime. 95% of the cases against local journalists, highlighting those who are highlighting corruption and abuse of power. Every time the perpetrator of a crime is allowed to escape punishment, this nourishes a vicious cycle of violence that is poisonous to all society, undermining human rights and dignity, weakening the rule of law. Third, we must strengthen the safety policies in both conflicts and peacetime situations. This places a premium on more effective training and mechanisms for police forces and judiciary to conduct investigation on attacks on journalists. Crimes of journalists is the absolute form of censorship. Lastly, we must all speak out loud and clear every time a crime is committed and call for justice. This is UNESCO's mandate to defend press freedom, to publicly condemn all killings of journalists, media workers, and social media producers of news who die in the, in the line of duty. In every case, the Director General of UNESCO urges the authorities to conduct swift and thorough investigations. To move on all forms, UNESCO is spearheading the United Nations Plan of Action on the Safety of Journalists and the Issue of Impunity. This is the first mechanism to join the efforts of the UN agencies, governments, civil society, academia, and the media. Propelled by the Plan of Action, UNESCO is leading programs of advocacy, capacity building, protection mechanisms, research and training, in places like Nepal, in South Sudan, in Tunisia, in Pakistan, in Somalia, in Mexico, and many other countries. We need to accelerate this momentum. Governments must develop better laws and mechanisms to enforce, to enforce them. News organizations also need to operate effective safety policies. Journalists should be more proactive in protecting themselves online and in the physical world and should also better take into account the risk of psychological traumas, which can have a devastating effect. This call for justice was underlined on the 9th and 10th of October in an international conference of judges, which UNESCO organized with the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in Costa Rica. It was taken forward with a one-day national consultation workshop on the state of journalist safety in Pakistan held with UNESCO in Islamabad October 29th. The same message is being sent today in Paris at a conference to commemorate the day of the day, this day at UNESCO with the Director General Irina Bokova, UNESCO's Goodwill Ambassador for Freedom of Expression and Journalist Safety, Christiana Mampour, and Her Excellency Alice Ba Kunek, Swedish Minister for Culture and Democracy, as well as Bath Sheba Crocker, United States Assistant Secretary of State. Later today, there will be an event on ending impunity at the United Nations headquarters in New York, with the support of the permanent representatives and ambassadors of Greece and Lithuania. The same messages are carried forward in the report we launched today. World trends in freedom of expression and media development, a special digital focus. I wish to thank the government of Sweden for the depth of its support to UNESCO in all its work to defend freedom of expression. Today, additional events are being held in the Netherlands, Ghana, Liberia, Tunisia, South Sudan, Nigeria, and Nepal, among others, to foster to end impunity for crimes against journalists. As UNESCO celebrates its 70th anniversary, our founding mandate to promote the free flow of ideas by word and image has never been so important. To advance the right to freedom of expression, to promote peace and sustainable developments through media freedom, pluralism, independence, and journalist safety. 
the global communication and information environment has been transformed by the spread of digital technologies. Today, more than 3 billion women and men worldwide use the internet, and more than 6 billion have access to mobile phones. These technologies have expanded the possibilities for progress towards sustainable knowledge societies, while also raising new challenges. The second world trends in freedom of expression and media development report gives days depth with a focus on trends in four specific areas. Online hate speech, protection of journalism sources in the digital age, the role of internet intermediaries in fostering freedom online, and the safety of journalists. These are part of the ecology in which journalism can make its unique contributions in conditions of safety to the achievement of the new 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. In closing, dear friends, let me thank all of our speakers and moderators here today, especially William Horsley, Director of the Center for Freedom of Media from the University of Sheffield, who has been instrumental in organizing this event in London. I wish also to thank the active participation of the partner organizations and International and Article 19. This is an important event, and we are grateful for your attendance and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Salil Tripathi, and I'm the chair of the Writers in Prison Committee at Pan International. After these uh, words, which were sobering and at the same time a stirring call for what needs to be done from UNESCO um, and from the MP, uh, we now turn to the work at hand. Uh, people around me are uh, very well known for their work, courageous work, brave work. Um, and they have amazing stories to tell about um, their experiences. I won't introduce them in great detail because you all have their biodata, but very briefly, in the order in which they will be speaking, let me quickly introduce them and then say a few remarks and then we start off. To my immediate left is Allah Bayomi, who is a senior news producer at Al Jazeera English, responsible for monitoring the channel's coverage of the Middle East news for accuracy, balance, and breaking news. He's an Egyptian national working in Doha, and he has published two books on U.S. foreign policy. Uh, and one of the things that is uh, on his resume, which uh, is certainly uncalled for, is that he has been convicted in absentia for terrorism-related offenses. To my immediate right is Emma Beals. Uh, she is a New Zealand British freelance journalist. Congratulations on rugby. <laughs> <laughs> Based in um, and. Condolences, I should also say that while I'm at it, yes. Um, uh, but Emma has been working out of southern Turkey, and she has been going to covering the Syrian conflict since 2012. She frequently travels in the country to produce on-the-ground reporting for outlets, including USA Today, Guardian, Vice News, Daily Beast, Al Jazeera, and so on. Um, she has also been co-hosting an internet radio show, and most interestingly, a topic on which I would like you to talk a bit more about is being a founding member of Frontline Freelance Register. To my far left uh, is Kevin Sutcliffe, who is the head of news program at the European Union uh, for Vice News, which is a new international online news organization created by and for a connected generation. Uh, he has managed and commissioned, uh, the, the commissioned the documentaries, current affairs, and news content for Vice News ever since the channel started in March. And he has won numerous awards. And uh, to my extreme right is Peter Greston. He is an Australian Latvian journalist and uh, doesn't need introduction again for not very pleasant reasons. I mean, he has had to spend an enormous amount of time in captivity in jail for crimes that he did not commit. Um, and uh, he is not only a symbol of what this is all about, but also has become a champion of where we need to go. So it would be very interesting what he has to say about this. Let me briefly introduce what PEN is all about. Some of you might know, but uh, perhaps some don't. PEN is an organization of readers, writers, authors, critics, playwrights, which works for two aims, with two aims. One is to promote uh, reading, I mean freedom to read, read what you want and freedom to write, write what you want. That is the essence behind 
and we do research on these cases. I've talked about some of our statistics. And we advocate positions, which are not only with governments, but also with intergovernment organizations. And we always remind ourselves of this empty chair, which is always with us wherever we have an event. Uh, it's very important for us to focus the conversation today on the key issue, which is impunity. It is about press freedom, it is about safety, but it is also about impunity. Journalists ask questions, they try to take the story forward, they push the narrative, they want to find out what's going on and why, and they have questions, they are curious, and they ask the questions not only because they are interested, but because people who want to consume what they produce are interested in that. They have a right to do so, it's also a, it's a, not only a right out of their own curiosity as, as humans, but also because of rights guaranteed under the international human rights architecture. And yet, there are three types of threats that journalists face. One is in conflict, the other is when state attacks journalists because they ask too many questions or inconvenient questions, things that governments don't want to be revealed, things that people in power or people with power or people who have power of some form uh, do not want to come out of corruption or human rights abuses. And then there are journalists who are killed by non-state actors. Uh, in the list of countries that we talked about, we can't forget what happened over the weekend in Bangladesh, where once again a publisher this time was uh, hacked to death. And for the crime, if at all it is a crime, of publishing the works of a blogger who is a free-thinking blogger. And that's an attack from a non-state actor. And this has been, uh, and uh, so there is a non the threat from the non-state non actor, and there is a threat from the state itself. Uh, the report, if once you will see, you will find from the report that there are cases after cases where governments are not doing enough, are not being sufficient, not being transparent, even in reporting back to UN agencies when they ask serious questions about uh, shortcomings on the part of their, their work. Um, uh, we were told that the figure of uh, deaths this year is probably around 70. The statistics that we had gathered at Penn show the figure of 49, but it's more than a, about two dozen cases of countries from Latin America, of course, Asia, Africa, and also we mustn't forget Europe, and not just Ukraine, but earlier this year, France. And this has been an ongoing trend, and it has been um, something that needs to stop, and, and, and yet people with power are acting with impunity in this regard. And that is why this report is very important. I've spoken enough, let me turn to Allah so that he can start with his story. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to start with thanking the organizers and thanking everyone who's attending this event today. I think coming from Jazeera, from the Middle East, being an Arab, being an Egyptian, I can't emphasize enough how important uh, this event is and how important also to me personally. I, I, I just, uh, um, uh, before coming, I, I, I spoke to my, some of my colleagues at Al Jazeera. Uh, yesterday, we celebrated uh, the 19th anniversary of Al Jazeera. And uh, basically, unfortunately, in the last 19 years, we lost nine journalists. But six of them died since the beginning of the Arab, uh, Arab Spring. Five died in Syria, one in Libya. So it just shows how dangerous the Middle East is becoming. It just, you can't emphasize how Certain countries are becoming uh, a threat to journalism, to journalists in general. Egypt is, is, is a case. Uh, there's 60, as we speak today, there's 60 Egyptian journalists behind bars. Uh, one of them has been sentenced to death for reporting certain news. Most of them are being accused with the same accusations, of, uh, spreading false information, being members of the Muslim Brotherhood, and like, you know, threatening, uh, like, you know, calling for violence. Just the, the same stereotypes. And we hardly any evidence presented against them, as I'm going to speak about my case. But it is not just Egypt, it is also Syria is, is, is becoming a serious threat. Yemen, and unfortunately Yemen, in Yemen it's an interesting case because I think there is plenty of cases which go unreported. Because the country is very poor, it's very isolated. So nobody really knows what's happening in Yemen. Just two weeks ago, the director of our office, the Houthis went to his office in Sana'a, they surrounded the whole neighborhood, his house, they went inside, they searched for him, and destroyed the house. So he, I, I think he's in hiding, and he has been in hiding since the beginning of the conflict, but his family is, is under threat. Uh, one of our young uh, cameramen in Syria was killed in June. I remember the day that he, was, he died, I was at work, he was covering pro uh, protests, or, or actually conflict in Dara. Uh, he's uh, very young, early 20s, his father died, his Older brother died, he has a younger brother who was the only one taking care of him, but unfortunately also he lost his life. So the issue of media freedoms, protection of journalists is, is really significant at this moment, is a very 
important in the Middle East. I don't know what could be done. Uh, just uh, some people, like as, as, uh, 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 the, the head of the, uh, the panel introduced me. I, I have, unfortunately, I, I, I have this conviction in Egypt where me and Peter are part of the same case. But believe it or not, this is my first time to meet Peter in person. We have been part of the same case, we accused of being cons like conspiring against Egypt to, to, to for news. But I never met him in person before today. And it shows you how silly the whole issue is. I remember when I joined the Jazeera, I was coming from the US. I, was there, I lived there for 10 years, studying, working. So I met a Tunisian friend, and uh, he was he, he, he told me, you can go to back your country. This is great. I can't go back to my country. So I felt maybe this Tunisian guy has something wrong, has did something wrong. And I told myself, we work for Jazeera, but stay out of trouble. You know? <laughs> Don't get yourself in, involved in anything that would, would, would put you in a situation like this. I work as a senior producer in something called in the, in the Middle East, this in Egypt, where I'm in charge of monitoring the flow of information inside everything on the Middle East, going inside the Jazeera English and coming out. So we monitor the outsources. We usually the first people to know the channel where an event is happening. We alert everyone. We monitor how the process of information happens. So I've been part of the Arab Spring coverage. I'm part of the Jazeera English since it was established. So I was part of the Arab Spring coverage. I worked on the Egypt desk, I worked on the Syria desk, so I have been part of the process. But my job in particular is to try to keep new, zero neutral. I don't like part of our job is to be careful not to be pro-Sunni or pro Shia, not to pro Muslim Brotherhood or pro Sisi, not to be against any party. We just part of my job is to be careful and make sure just as during my shift, I'm not the only one in charge, it's a big machine. So there's lots of people who are charged, but part of my work is just to make sure we are neutral, not partisan. We don't take sides in the conflict. We just have the facts. So it was amazing how I got involved in this case. Until today, I don't really know why I was part of it. There is lots of Egyptians at the channel, lots of people who do my work who are also Egyptians. I did try to ask everybody, why me? Why, why, why I came, why I become part of this case? But nobody has given me a clear answer. Usually, it, the trial has been going on for two years. And I was fortunate enough, I, I wasn't in jail. I, I wasn't tortured, I wasn't insulted, I didn't lose anything. I was sitting in Doha most of the two years, but waiting for news. But usually I hear my name twice. The day the trial starts, the day an appeal starts, and the day it ends. So, but it's not mentioned in the middle. Like I, I, I wish you sometimes, like, they can tell me what is the evidence against me. Have you written something wrong? Is it because, <laughs> I don't know, that. does anyone know me? The, as the Egyptian government, for example, doesn't like Arab Yumi, like, you know, does he know me personally? I don't know. Uh, but I, as, as like, I remember, Peter, I called you, I don't know if you remember this, like three, four months ago, I called you and you gave me an advice. I, I, I even doubt if you can still remember this, but you told me, like, you know, don't think about it too much. Uh, <laughs> because uh, basically, two years without any piece of information, why you got 10 years in, in, in sentence, you can go, go back to your country. I'm too afraid to send my kids. Uh, I'm becoming like, if this problem continues, it could be extremely straightening legally. Like, you know, if you can't have a home, what does it mean to you? How can we solve it? I, I personally am not an expert in, yes. I'm not an expert in uh, you know, human rights, and I'm just a journalist. I don't know what kind of advice I can give you, but as an Arab journalist, I can, tell you, I can think of three, three things at least. I think we as Arab journalists, or as journalists in general, we have to think more about educating ourselves, being more proficient, being more neutral, being more independent. I think in the Arab world in particular, because you, there is no independent media, and most of the media is either pro-government or pro-opposition. If you are not pro authority, you are usually trying to get in a position. But the concept of independent media is not there. So I think if we work with media organizations, we need to put in the journalists that you have to stand neutral. There is a third category. You don't have to be pro power or pro an opposition group. You can be a third category, which is the neutral one. I think also there is a need to educate the, the public. I don't think, like in a region that like the Middle East, people really understand what the job of journalists is and who is a journalist. It's just, I, I think, and usually, and they always think a journalist is either pro-government or pro-opposition. They don't think of a journalist as pro-public, as someone who cares for the public interest. Finally, dealing with governments, at the short term, I think we need to speak up. 
like you know, I know there's lots of conflicts in the Middle East, there's wars, uh, there's lots of crises. But also speaking about, about media freedoms could help. You know, every time we raise the awareness, we speak up to government, is useful. On 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 the long term, I don't know if there is an international legal mechanism where journalists can provide protection for journalists. And also, as a last point, I think our struggle as media is part of freedom struggle in a region like in, around the world. It's part of the democratic struggle. Like most of the news today in the Middle East, it's usually about the war with ISIS, it's about the Syrian conflict, it's about wars. But the idea of spreading freedoms, caring for democracy, building the civil society, building media is becoming sidelined. It's, it's a little bit forgotten. So I, I don't know if, if we can sustain some kind of agenda, a pro-freedom, pro-democracy, pro-civil society, pro-journalism, Agenda, serious agenda that has been three steps that we can work on, along with the war with ISIS, the war in Yemen, the war in Syria, would be very useful. Thank you. Thanks so much, Andrew. Thank you very much. You have given some interesting, interesting pointers for the second panel as well, but I'll go to that at the end. Emma. Thanks. I just want to apologize for my voice. It's um, conspired with those that <coughs> seek to silence journalists. It's not what we're about. Um, I'm going to talk about my experiences in Syria over the last few years. Um, on the 19th of August last year, the Mosul Tehran Offensive was in full swing. The Middle East Press Corps had been for drinks in a hotel in Urbel, and as we usually did when more than a couple of us got together, we turned to talking about our kidnapped friends and wondering when we might see them again. We didn't know it at the time, but within hours we were going to be greeted by images on Twitter that changed our lives forever. It was James and there was a man with a knife. I was on assignment for Kevin here at the time. And I remember in the hours afterwards, all I did was pace and shout. Two weeks later, we were all in Istanbul. There was a training for freelance journalists about identifying arms in war zones. Once again, we checked Twitter and this time it was speed. We all fell into each other's arms crying. The rest of last summer in autumn passed into some sort of nightmare that will never end for me. Every day, that's the first thing that I think of when I wake up. I always thought that following the depictions of grief, were outlandish and contrived, and that that's not how people actually acted. But they do. They can recount in excruciating detail every day where I was, who was there, what was said. Like the 8th of October this year, just a couple of weeks ago, I was in dinner, at dinner in Soho when I learned that Saleha Mohammed, Leia, the Syrian photographer who had driven me, fed me, and housed me whenever I went to Syria, had been killed by ISIS. I was in Aleppo the week that Steve was kidnapped. Of the half a dozen or so foreigners that were in the country that week, I am, as far as I know, the only one who is alive or free to talk to you today. So, as a speaker, I'd like to honour you. The imprisonment and deaths of journalists in Syria since 2012 by all sides has affected our work, the course of the war, policy and policy making, and we're all called for. No the journalist was asking me the other day why the Arab Spring generation are all a bit nuts. He was genuinely trying to understand and bridge the gap between his generation and mine. Many of the best and brightest journalists I know from my age group are struggling very hard. The answer, I think, is that things are different. Journalism is under attack, and when we go to work, walk to work, almost everyone that we can encounter wants the color of a prisoner. Sometimes waking up seems like a nearly full pursuit. In the last three years in the course of my job, I'm only going to mention the incidents involving the government or reasonably organised non-state actor. They have been seriously threatened with death. I've had sources followed home from meetings with me nearly abducted. I've had the head of security for an allied country pull me into a bathroom with another man trying to assault me. I've been arrested at gunpoint, I've been thrown in prison, and I've been accused of ridiculous things. The cumulative nature of this makes it very difficult to continue working in the region. In Syria, seven journalists are currently imprisoned by the Syrian government. At least 85 have been killed, and at least 25 remain the same for being kidnapped. What does this mean? Well, in Syria, it means there's no news. In a war that's changing the makeup of the Middle East, it was responsible for the largest movement of people since World War II, we have no eyes on anything. The Assad regime, who's responsible for the death of Mary Colvin, Injuries to other journalists, and million, deaths and injuries to millions of civilians, has been able to act with complete impunity. 
It's not possible to express the destruction of any body, the horror of the aftermath of the power bombing, or the visceral terror of lying awake listening to flames drop bombs indiscriminately on civilians without having experienced it. And at the moment, we can't do that. The Islamic State that killed our friends and used them as propaganda are able to act as they please. And neither we as foreign reporters nor Syrian reporters can cover it. Last week, brave, brave activists from Raqqa has been silently slaughtered. But the only news sources for the Nazis territory countering the PR campaign were beheaded in their homes in Turkey. So we can't report on ISIS from the ground, but with new draconian uses of terror powers in recent weeks within this country and the seas where our BBC journalists, laptops, and video from other researchers, it starts to mean we cannot adequately report about this group, their motivations, and what's driving people to join them from this country either. It's a dangerous road to go down where we are unable to safely report on the threat like ISIS from anywhere in a meaningful way. That feels awfully like the trail of our colleagues and friends' memories to leave this unpopular reporter. There is some good happening. There's an organisation that was mentioned that I started with colleagues through the Frontline Club called the Frontline Freelance Register and we seek to support freelancers in these conflicts. And in the wake of last year's killings, we've teamed up with a large media organisations and freedom of expression in NGOs across the world to try and improve conditions for freelancers. Together we're able to address issues like cheap insurance and better contractual relationships with employers. But we are not able to address the targeted killing of journalists by states and state life actors. It's a job for governments and that's why we're here. I think we'll look back on Syria in the same way that we have this for wonder in the Balkans. Seeing it as a dark day in our shared humanity where we've allowed mass murder and chaos to take place unchecked. The reasons I've taken the risks I have is because I never wanted anyone to be able to say they didn't know what was happening. But we run a very real risk in Syria and as it springs and possibly in future wars of not knowing, and that would be an equally big trip for me. Thank you very much for these powerful and moving stories. Um, I'm Kevin Sutcliffe, I'm uh, the editor of Vice News, we launched uh, two years ago. Prior to that I was at Channel 4 uh, for a decade where I sent uh, teams to many of the most difficult parts of the world. Uh, so I'm well versed in risk, danger and safety analysis for journalists. And um, the landscape has shifted so dramatically in the 10 to 15 years that I've been in charge of the safety of many teams. Um, it's fair to say now it's open season on journalists from many, many sources. Now, it used to be that being a journalist and waving a card in the hall would remember this, you know, that you could have a certain amount of uh, immunity, that you were a journalist in a scene, and that uh, somehow you were not part of the scene, but you were allowed to witness that scene. That has evaporated, um, and in the last five years, certainly, all our safety protocols, the way we approach journalism, has changed dramatically because journalists are not safe from anyone. Uh, they're not safe from governments, they're not safe from non-state actors. Uh, often in some non-chaotic countries they're not safe because of the way people now view journalists are a threat. Um, just trying to do the job now, uh, I think it's not to understand the case in the risk of life in many parts of the world. So with that in mind, we go forward to advice news, we do an immersive uh, form of journalism where we have to go to places to see up close what, uh, what is happening. We have to go out to try and meet some of the most difficult people on earth uh, and we try and understand how to make that safe for our journalists. Um, and that, over for, for my career, has involved uh, dealing with abductions, kidnaps, uh, disappearances and reappearances, uh, some uh, comedy, some not. Uh, and currently uh, we are going through uh, an issue with the Turkish government, which I think probably, if I unpack that a bit for you, might, might um, give you an insight into is what it's like trying to be um, a, a journalistic organisation that just wants to do its job, which is just to report what actually uh, is um, a rather straightforward story in uh, South East and Turkey. Um, about two months ago, uh, I sent uh, two uh, reporters from England to meet uh, Mohammed Rasul who is a young local journalist uh, who worked for us in Syria and is in Istanbul. And the, the idea was to go and meet, uh, or try and understand what was going on with the PKK and also the chaotic situation in southeast Turkey. Um, pretty straightforward, once you've done the safety for that, that's just 
can we work out for it properly, can we get their pictures back, uh, and uh, how long are we going to go for? Um, after a couple of weeks, uh, the team were detained in Derbak here by the uh, Turkish security forces, uh, and then 11 days of a quite chaotic and hard to understand process happened, in which they were accused uh, by the Turkish authorities of uh, working either for the PKK or for ISIS. Uh, when we pointed yeah. out that you can't do both at the same time, uh, it, the, the charge got changed to a very general terror charge. And we scrambled to try and get support to the journalists uh, who were put in prison in Dirac here, uh, tried to understand a process, a uh, Turkish legal process. Uh, after 11 days, we managed to get the two British journalists out. Um, but the, the case against them still, uh, still stands. But the prosecutor decided to keep uh, Mohammed Razul in custody. He remains there after eight weeks. Uh, he's, we've had eight weeks of trying, uh, petitioning for him to get out while the case uh, is looked at by the prosecutor, but he's been detained and he faces uh, charges of working with an unnamed terrorist organization. We're well, faced with quite a Kafka esque situation as a, a, as a journalistic organisation. Um, we have uh, local legal support, uh, we have uh, international support, uh, notes we can pay. Um, there's a huge diplomatic effort going on uh, and it seems to have stalled. Uh, there was an election yesterday, we thought that that was a moment where the rather sort of ludicrous uh, charges and everything was sort of loosened and that this would just be seen as part of some theatre, it, it appears not. And it appears that we have a 24-year-old uh, uh, Iraqi Kurd uh, being accused of very grave offences, for which uh, there is no real way of trying to appeal directly, or it appears directly, to either the, ju the judiciary or the Turkish uh, authorities that seems to make any sense. And so, um, as an example of what a journalistic organisation faces, I think that's probably, and maybe Peter might have something to say on this too, that's just one of one angle of, of, of what happens when you're trying just to do what's well, really a straightforward job of reporting what you find. Um, and so, if that gives you a sort of insight, it, what that's done is that's dragged in um, and sucked in an enormous number of people who are attempting to uh, pressure the Turkish government, make them understand that whatever it was they thought they were doing when they arrested three journalists and accused them of terrorism offences. Actually, this is a huge international mistake. It plays very badly for the Turkish government. It throws a spotlight on the Turkish government's um, attitude towards uh, journalists in its own country, which uh, I think, as most people know, is extraordinarily poor. Um, but also, it also raises another issue, um, the, for, which I think is touched on here as well. There are sort of several layers of, of journalists we're talking about here. I send Western journalists to lots of difficult, dangerous places. They're able to operate there because they're experts at doing that and because of the context they know. But they're also experts at doing that because of the people they know on the ground and the people they work with on the ground. And Mazul, uh, Mohammed Mazul is one of those people. We could not operate in these places around the world and get our stories out without local fixers, local journalists who, in lots of ways, and I think this demonstrates, um, potentially are a more risk of greater risk. Because actually we, we can put a lot of pressure on um, diplomatic channels and we can point out that it's patently not true that two journalists, one from Northampton and one from Wigan, are um, members of ISIS or PKK. Easy to demonstrate, very hard to demonstrate when you have a young man who's from Simona, who's a Kurd uh, with Turkish residency. Very, very hard to fight the propaganda that's come out around him. So I think it's also worth remembering here, and one of the things we should talk about later maybe, is that local journalists, the ones who are left behind when big media organisations leave, are very, very vulnerable. So I think, for me, the lesson of the last 10 years has been, and it's a very sad lesson, is that I think the, the open source journalists, it's, it's now we have to respond in so many different ways to protect our journalists, in so many different ways now to get the story out. It's way harder than it was a decade ago. Thank you very much indeed. Peter? Thanks, I'm going to be pretty brief. Um, I'm keen to get on with the discussion. But, but there are a couple of things I wanted to say and pick up on a couple of things that um, Kevin mentioned. 
One of the really disturbing statistics is um, that, to my mind, says a lot about what the problem is. Is, is the number of, of the number of journalists who are in prison? I think there are over two hundred at the moment. Uh, more than two thirds of them are in there for crimes against the state, in there for sedition, for terrorism charges, and so on. Which tells us, I think, a lot about what's going on here. To my mind. Um, the whole war on terror changed the dynamic. Again, Kevin spoke about the last 10 to 15 years as being the turning point. Um, I think what's happened is that we've seen the middle ground, the safe ground that journalists used to be able to operate, gutted. When George Bush said, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists, he made it a binary choice. You're either on one side of the line or the other, and that removed the, the neutral middle ground that we used to operate. Um, it's now almost taken as a kind of standard tactic by governments who want to silence the media to use charges of terrorism and or national security as an excuse to lock up journalists. And that's exactly what happened to me and my colleagues um, to our lab. Um, we were all accused of terrorism simply for, for speaking to what was then considered, broadly widely considered to be the opposition. And so while the non-state actors are clearly major problems, and I know these problems myself, I was with one of my colleagues, Kat Payton, when she was shot and killed in Somalia in 2005. But I still think what's changed has been the kind of, we speak about the culture of impunity, and it, it is a culture, it's a political culture which has, which has, made, which has made a story in, in a conflict over ideas, it's made the media space the legitimate battlefield and so journalists have become the targets in this space. But it's no longer a war over stuff, it's a war over reason. And what this has done is effectively made, created a binary situation for us where the ground that we traditionally operated in, as I said, has vanished. And I think that's something we need to address. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we have about 17 or so um, questions. And if you can identify who you are and uh, keep it brief so that we can have as many as we can. Okay, while you think of your question, the last one was. Oh, sorry, please. Oh, please. Um, I'm clearly with. I remember um, during the, uh, the Gulf War um, the incident where an American tank was pretty much, I think, targeted. Uh, a Reuters TV crew um, in in, uh, in Iraq, um, and so we should remind ourselves that actually some some other countries that you think of as, as having some well functioning democracies with, with freedoms of, of being involved in targeting journalists, and I think Reuters investigated that um, uh, it, it, itself, and it's a dis disturbing um, development. Um, do you are there any for you for, for you you are. Overseas, are there any any safe havens? Are there any any countries where where if you've got if you you feel safe where you've got the involvement of America or Britain or or does everybody put people at risk these days if you don't toe the line? Um, well, but I think I mean the short answer is no. I mean let, let's let's be clear here. We're not saying that um, Britain is equivalent to ISIS. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, I was just, no, I know, I know. But, but, and, and so to say that we somehow you know, feel unsafe operating in Britain is perhaps a no, little bit overseas. Uh, you know, well, even overseas. I mean, the point is that there. The point is that I, I haven't been. I must admit, I haven't been across the discussion, the debates around the uh, what they call the um, extremist disruption orders, the EDOs. I think Theresa May is considering in this country, which I think. Um, I, I don't know enough about about the debate, but what it clearly does is starts to limit the space that journalists are able to operate in and creates definitions that, although they're intended to deal with very specific problems, can equally be applied to other more broader issues. And that starts to limit the work that journalists do. And if we start to investigate, say, in the British government's handling of, um, of the war on terror, if we start in Australia, my own country, and we're seeing similar legislation that I think, again, places the work that we places us at risk when we start to move into that, that sphere of, of journalism. And so even those places that you might traditionally have thought of as bastions of freedom of speech 
a change in the dynamic. And I think that's that's a very serious problem. And we run the risk of, of seeing these kinds of limitations on press freedom and without fully appreciating the impact that that will have on the effectiveness of the press to, to do its job in functioning democracy. I mean, I'm sorry to jump in, but it's really important while we've got Kevin and uh, Peter here to ask you what you mean when you say we've got to get the story out. I mean, the reality is that the, the, journal, uh, the, the media are not reporting this story. They're not reporting the realities, the grimy realities in a third of the world where journalists are simply treated as criminal. They're criminalised before they start. This is the precursor to impunity. This is creating the climate in advance so that the, the bad guys, whether they're in government or in uh, the, uh, the bandits, uh, are beyond reach, right? Now, uh, the IPI and others, actually Al Jazeera, have tried to pull the media together. We've had several meetings with big media around the world to, 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 to get across this idea that, uh, that there should be a pro-democracy, uh, simply in the sense that you cannot be neutral uh, between uh, those who are oppressing and those who are uh, living, uh, exercising their rights. What more can be done? I mean, and also, what can be done, Peter, about the Al Jazeera, your, yourself and Al Jazeera colleagues living outside these danger zones who are also criminalized and therefore their, their life may have to be put on hold? Um, well, I think, I, mean, I think getting the story out, I mean, as a practitioner, I think what we're trying to do um, you know, when we set up to to try and tell a story, you know, the journalists are committed to that and within the parameters of whether that's safe, um, we do that. And I think there's not a, you know, not a lot of journalists that are that reflective of the, the, the issues that, are, that, that surround what they're doing. Quite a lot of the time they're completely obsessive, um, either obsessed with their you know, with, uh, Twitter and what's going on there, or how to get the story out, like that. So I, th I think that um, if you talk to any of our journalists, that's what they'd say. They'd just be, I've got several complete serial obsessives who are, and if you looked at our outputs over the last year, um, for me, I mean, I sometimes say, you know, we are the completists on, on the story. We've done everything the nicest all the way around, to our most everyone. Um, so I think that, um, you know, in terms of looking at the coverage over periods of time, I think we, we would say we've done a rounded uh, coverage. T to your point about sort of how do we address this issue about how we are viewed or treated as journalists, I think that's very difficult. We're all members of various organisations. I mean, next week we're going to World Pack, a very respected organisation that very early on um, saw the issue about supporting freelancers around the world. Um, I think it's very hard then to get a government to listen to what they think are sort of rather sort of intellectual ideas of freedom of expression and those things. It's very, very hard to break through and have that meeting and try and explain that, try to explain that to Theresa May today. That's, that's not what's on her agenda. So I think it's very, very hard to find, if I was trying to work out what the campaign was, I think it's very hard to find out what the nose of that campaign is because you can't argue against the generality of it. It is not right what's going on. The journalists are killed, the journalists are threatened. But how do you enshrine that, frame that, and then give that a campaign? Yeah, I'm, I'm still, I think that's a very hard thing and we need to do more work on that. Yeah, I think we're never so crap, journalists are never so crap as when they're reporting about themselves. Yeah. That's one of our problems. And, we, we tend to feel quite, we get, tend to squirm quite a lot whenever you end up reporting on our issues that, around press freedom. Um, we don't do a very good job of it, and I think that's a big part of the problem. I worry a lot that in the debate around, um, in the debates around national security, we don't really, we haven't done a, a very good job at all about explaining the consequences of limiting what is by definition the fourth estate alongside the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature, the one of the four pillars of the democracy. Um, and how if you start to unpack, if you, if you start to weaken any one of those, the whole edifice starts to get very creaky. Now the first three 
pillars of democracy are very obvious. The fourth one is, is a bit like the wallpaper. We tend, particularly in a place like the UK, Australia, and, and the States across Europe, where, where free press has, has, has been pretty ubiquitous for most of the past, most of the last generation, certainly since the Second World War. It's almost like oxygen. You don't really appreciate it when it's there, but when you don't have it, it is when you really understand how essential it is to the way that we live. And so we, what we need to do is emphasize what our world might look like if we do, make, if we do place serious um, limits around press freedom. I mean, it's, it's quite hard to explain to people. So if you um, want to try and investigate something in Britain, the first step, my first step, is going to be more. Because actually now, what you're doing is you're going into battle against the government and whatever legislation, if you're looking at anti-terror legislation or issues around anti-terror, if you're looking at any of those sort of issues around state secrecy, all of those things, what you're doing is you're mounting a, a, an extraordinary enterprise of which, yes, journalism is part of it, but now we're engaged in a, a completely different way of operating in order to try and negotiate to try and get information that doesn't get dragged back to a production order or into court. So I think while we're talking in here, we talk about safety, I think Peter makes another very good point, which is we, we are very good at explaining the mechanics of what we have to do in order to try and even get some basic stories out here. I mean, I speak from the experience of, of luxury of having um, a television channel behind me when I was doing investigations and the costs of that, which are not talked about. And I think maybe one of the things to try and explain to people is actually what journalism is. It isn't just rocking up somewhere and filming and getting out. It's actually now very complicated quite expensive and very detailed enterprise. And again, that's a very hard thing. You know, we don't, we're not very good at selling that, I don't think. Just, just as, as I hear Peter and Kevin talking, I, I think the problem with the Middle East, like, you know, once foreign journalists are in the Middle East, they face a bigger problem, I think, because basically it's a whole culture of freedom of expression, freedom of information. Democracy, to some extent, is not there. That, 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 especially with the, what we, some people call the counter-revolution that are called after Zara Spring has failed, and most of the authoritarian governments went back. What's, what part, part of the campaign was to crush the idea of, um, like, you know, to crack on, on journalism, crack off the freedom of information on the other point of view. So you are faced with a situation when you don't have basic fundamentals of democracy and Freedoms. So it's such a bigger challenge because even the people themselves don't understand the job and don't understand the, the basics. So unless you have a push for freedoms, a push for democracy in, in general, you will not be able. You don't sound as I don't like to sound in, in our world as a selfish journalist. Like you know, you see hundreds, like in Egypt, for example, there's over forty thousand people in jail. Most of them are political activists. Only 60 of them are journalists. If I stand, if I write, if I write an article saying defend the rights of journalists, you will tell me, oh, you're talking about 60 where there's 40,000 political activists in, in jail and you, you just care about your profession, about yourself. So I think our struggle is part of a bigger struggle. And if we don't defend, if we don't try to change the whole environment, it's very difficult to defend us. Okay. So we have seven minutes. I have Thomas, I have got Evan, and then maybe. I'll let you have the first go at the end if you want to have some concluding comments, <coughs> and then we can go to the rest. I do have a question for you, if you want that. We can that. have a bit more time. Another five minutes. Okay, we can. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thomas Hughes from Article 19. Um, so, really, a question, I guess, to Kevin and Peter. Where, where we've spoken about local freelancers. Um, where does the line of responsibility for international media using freelancers sit? Are there certain things that should be done? In advance of freelancers, should freelancers even be used? And certainly, if they're entertained, what should international media be doing? And I think that's something that Amos might want to come in on that. Of course. Yeah. Um, do you want me to? Um, I, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're very clear that so when we employ anybody who is not directly a vast news staff, they're part of the team, they ensure everything uh, is as though they are a member of, uh, of the team, and they are. Um, but, but more than that, you, you've really got to go into, it's great that they can give us this story, or it's a story we want to work on with them, but is it safe for them to do that, and what happens when, when we leave? 
So all of those things are um, inner calculations to whether you will do or will not do a story with someone in a particular place. Are they vulnerable? Are you making them vulnerable? Uh, even if they want to do it, is that the like? Can you make all those judgments? The other thing that uh, we don't do, and I think a lot of new, news organisations have stopped doing this, is the cold approach. I'm thinking of going to X. And you can go, well, I'm not so sure, but show us it when you come back. That is gone, because that was, that was sort of in a way provoking the market, you know, which was, oh, if, if you're in the market for that sort of thing, I, I might try to go and see ISIS and try to sell them. So there's actually a whole load of um, decisions and we, protocols in place that really just make the people we work with as safe as they possibly can. Because clearly, reputationally, that's the worst thing that can happen, that you are hanging out to dry someone you work with for a good story and you just left and come back home. Um, what, you know, what we're demonstrating, I hope, with Razul is you know, he's a member of the Vice News team. He should not be in prison. He was wrongly, he's been wrongly imprisoned on spurious charges and that has to stop. And we've been shouting there for the months about that. And that's what's important for us. Um, was there a lot of work on just basic guidelines internationally between news organisations and freelancers um, about how to get a work together and you know, clarify some of those things in advance? I think as far as safety goes, we've come a long way, but there's some of the, um, um, the issues around imprisonment and things are a bit less clear. So, you know, technically while they're on assignment, if they don't leave your prison, that's fine, but if you're still facing outstanding charges, that's a bit more ambiguous and there's obviously issues around you know your own reputation and your own sort of legal position as a freelancer which is a bit more difficult and since I've come back to this country I've been warned off doing certain stories um, and it being very antiquated because I didn't have a second income in my home therefore I could not afford to be ostracised by the British establishment um, as a freelancer so the first question when you were asked was you know you have a big meeting company that's going to back you for a very long time you have a hospital in <laughs> the 1950s. Um, so for freelancers, those sort of ongoing issues are a problem because what do you do? Who do you come for the assignment? You know, just because you might come back in one piece, you can still have plus the and all these and all of these sorts of things. And some of that stuff is not as well addressed by media organisations. Is you know, the, I think everyone's getting their head around flat jackets and insurance and stuff, so I'm even sure that's the rest of the, the, the more stuff is not crazy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's a mic if you want, yeah. I, I just wanted to reflect on what Peter said about the press not being full of the media, not being good at talking about journalism, because I have a slightly different perspective. I have two sort of dogs in the fight because I'm a trusted article 19. But as Paul said, I'm also director of Act Off, which campaigns for post publication remedy for ordinary people wronged by the press. And uh, when I was in Parliament, I uh, abolished um, the, the laws, this country's laws, unused on sedition and blasphemy and criminal defamation. Less successful on the glorification of terrorism and the overwide definition, sadly. But it is. But as Pete says, it's those things that are being used worldwide and arguably in this country with extremism, disruption orders, the prior restraint on university campuses, the attacks on the grounds of national security, on journalistic sources through the surveillance legislation, which we're going to get uh, a, a lovely new installment this Wednesday. And, um, and what I've noticed, and I've declared my bias, is that the large press organisations Cheerly these anti terror uh, uh, um, proposals without thought to what it means, well, I presume without thought to what it means for freedom of speech more generally, and cheer led Alan Rusbridger into being forced before the Select Committee to defend his Snowden work. At the same time, as the Commonwealth Parliamentary Union Media Trust, whatever that is, summoning the World Committee on um, freedom of the press to examine this country because of the suggestion that Leveson might require you know, equivalent prominence for corrections for wronged individual citizens uh, after the Daily Mail of the Sun has, has, has defamed them. And, uh, and they're not shy 
in terms of their own interests for these press media groups. And I'm just wondering whether there's a way of, of, of trying to change that dynamic and say, all right, you know, campaign in your own interest, but surely campaign also, I would say more, in the interests of journalists, the people that you work, that work for you and that you can put at risk uh, by the same token. And it's just galling to see that they say that this, this post-publication remedy is the biggest threat to press freedom in the world at the time when we know that there are deaths of journalists and this impunity exists. And, and there must be something that can be done. Um, but I just don't know what it is. I'm exactly. <laughs> Quick response to that, or um, I share I share your I share, share your exasperation. Um, you know, we don't have the the, the the suits here, and we might be wearing them, but you know the so-called suits are not here. Sorry, These are all reporters. No, I, Peter, you said this week in another place last week that when we pull together, there's a lot we can do. There's two. You said two billion impressions on social no, media. Three, three billion. Three now yeah. to get you to get you free. Yeah. But how do you translate that into the wider picture of the local journalists under constant attack? Well, yeah, there are a couple of things to be said. William, William, I don't know if you heard at the back, William's talking about um, the, the amount of social media heft and, and, and sort of unity of purpose. In our particular case, one of the most extraordinary things was the, the unbelievable unity, of, common unity of purpose that journalists showed right across the spectrum. We saw, even though we're Al Jazeera, we saw. Um, Christian and Amanpour and most, like, a whole bunch of CNN staffers um, being photographed on air with free AJ staff hashtags. We saw the whole of the BBC newsroom outside of the new broadcasting house with free AJ staff hashtags. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that unity of purpose. And as William said, there are two things that really struck me about this. The first was just what can be achieved when we pull together with a common sense of purpose. The other thing is just what a massive amount of effort it takes to spring three innocent blokes from prison. Um, if you think that that's what we have to do just to achieve that relatively minor un and frankly uncontroversial result, imagine what, it, what we've got to do to actually overturn the kind of trends towards impunity that we're seeing and the kind of legislation that you're talking about. Um, it, it, I think in a way what it comes back to what I was saying a moment ago, that that the free press for most of us has been so as, as ubiquitous as oxygen for such a long time, and yet by de if we deprive ourselves of it, we're at the risk of causing enormous damage to the systems that have actually created our country as the most stable, prosperous, and peaceful in the planet. Um, the other thing I do want to say before we run out of time is, is the, what, that this conversation, and we've, we've seen quite a number of these conversations happen here, and I was with them. Um, in New York, there was another similar conversation today. What we don't see are these conversations happening in Latin America. Mm. I work in, and live in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm sure as so I won't see these conversations happening down there. Um, I know that the Middle East, even though that's where most of the journalists seem to be dying these days, doesn't have these kinds of conversations, except around in bars when you've got a whole bunch of drunken journalists uh, um, farewelling departed friends. Asia, it's the same. It, it's 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 a very sort of Anglo, Eurocentric, Western um, concept at the, at the moment. It, for the life of me, I can't figure out why this isn't more of a pressing issue more globally. The, the, the statistics we're talking about are global statistics. Um, we have a problem here in these in, in the West around the national security legislation, which I don't think we are paying close enough attention to, but. But this is a very serious global trend, and we also need to try and, and broaden the debate. One quick thought, and okay, so I just something yeah. quicker. I think part of it is a learning process. I think what we, we are working on something very interesting at the Jazeera at this moment. I think the case where I and Peter have been like accused and sentenced somehow raised more awareness, even up to us as journalists, that we have to speak out more about our uh, rights. So I think we started an effort to document the cases of journalists abused by the Egyptian government. And the, the report is not out yet, but it will be a surprise. We have dozens of journalists that most of their cases went out unreported because the, the thing is, because the abuse is so common in countries like Syria, Yemen, and Egypt, Libya, you don't speak about it. But I think by cases like this, it raises awareness that we have to, to, to write it down, we have to document it. So we, hopefully, we hope sometime in December we'll publish a report about that. Like what now the Egyptian government did with 
uh, to see the journalists, which will be, I think, a surprise. Uh, the second part, which is the pro-regime media in the Middle East, are doing a lot of damage to the media itself. Like, you know, the attack on so many independent media organizations are coming, Western organizations, Al Jazeera, CNN, BBC, are coming from pro-media organizations. The problem is the regimes, dictator, dictator, dictatorship regimes, have their own, use the media as a tool, and they have lots of infrastructure of media outlets attacking the job. They are media journalists, but their work is to attack journalism and portray it as some kind of conspiracy against the country, except the pro-media uh, organization. So I think, uh, I don't know, like there, should, there is a need, a movement by independent media to strengthen itself, to speak out more and to, to find a solution on how we need to dialogue with the pro-regime media. In this country, we've had the same thing this week with MPs briefing to the media about you know, how frightful it is that journalists would deign to have FOI requests across government departments as if keeping government in check is not one of our prime powers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, just a thought to add to the conversation, which is one of the interesting things I read in the UNESCO report, is that uh, the non-international staff of journalists are far more at risk and which is something that you brought up, Kevin, in the context of Rasul. And the three countries I know well are India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. And you will find similar stories from those countries, too. I mean, uh, Bangladeshi bloggers would certainly want the freedom to write, and reporters would want to. But in the current climate, it's tough to get someone to come on record and criticize precisely because of the fear, and that's because of the impunity, which brings us back to the square of the main, main topic of the day, which is the impunity in which uh, people operate. It's similar in Pakistan, where you try to talk about Baluchistan, something happens to you. In India, in a very large state in central India, people are trying to investigate a particular examination scandal, and lots of people have died in mysterious circumstances. So uh, that impunity question becomes big. So as I end, but before we get into the next panel, um, a few questions that might help stir thinking in that regard. One is, how can the law help? Is the law doing enough? Is there the law in place at all? How can the system be help, uh, used to help the freelancers and those without the backup of large organizations? And what can be done in that regard? And what about those who are being left behind? Uh, just as the Rasul story that Kevin has been talking about, what can be done in that regard? It's terrific that we, you know, that you never had to go to Egypt, and it's terrific, Peter, that you're back uh, in this situation. But there are lots more uh, who are victims of this whole culture of impunity. So let's hear that. Probably some, one of the topics we can hear about in the next session. Thanks very much. Thank you.